Job, the second chapter. Hallelujah. Job is one of the least read books we can find. Did you know it's the oldest book in the Bible? Chronologically, it's the oldest book in the Bible. We'll be looking look down in verse 19. We're going to talk today about uh, turning defeats into victory. Hallelujah. You know, it's, and we can, we, anybody can get defeated. Don't take a whole lot of tr effort to get defeated. We live in a world that will defeat you if you let it. Yeah. Are you here? You go home. I mean, you can right down into defeat, all of a sudden, just out of nowhere. And, and God doesn't want us there. He wants us out of defeat into victory. Amen. Uh, you know, uh, the, you know I, I remember the uh, old ABC Wild World of Sports, the agony of defeat and the, thr the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Guy who jumps off the, the jump, height and the jump, the slalom jump, whatever that is. Uh, not the slalom jump, but the jump. And uh, it breaks his ankle. He goes down on his face and the ankle's falling. You know, like, they showed that for years on ABC's Wild World of Sports. Glad they stopped showing that because I got my stomach kind of turned every time I saw it. Hallelujah. Job chapter 2, verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Didst thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Woo! That's what you need. What an encouragement. That was a joke. Hallelujah. But he said to her, Thou speak as one of the foolish women speak. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And thou shalt, and shall we not receive evil? Is the, in this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, <clears throat> it didn't mean that Job was accurate. It said he didn't sin. All right, and we, we, we're not doing a teaching on Job, but I wanted to show you the state of desolation. Job had lost everything. His kids were killed. His, I mean, you know, his crops, I mean, he lost everything. Had boils all over him, was taking a, a broken clay and scraping the boils because, you know, this, I, I, I can imagine they were just painful and just, you know, itchy and just, just so he's just scraping them. I mean, just, he was just in a miserable state. And then comes his helpmeet, his soulmate. His companion for life with such words of encouragement as curse God and die. I could see where the Bobby Vinton got the song, Lonely, I'm Mr. Lonely, I'm so lonely, I could die. All right. Some of y'all remember that song? Yeah, all right. Here you go. Hallelujah. I mean, you know, here is Job <coughs> in this state of desolation. Everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever felt like there was no way out? <clears throat> that you were so far below bottom you had to jump up to touch bottom. Hello? You know, you look at people in the Bible and you think, man, I'm in a tough place. It's rough where I am. Yeah, but when you look at where you are, you're still breathing. Amen. 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 Didn't lose your kids, didn't lose a dog, didn't, you know. Of course, if you sing a country song backwards, you get it all back. But other than that, um, y'all ever heard that song? That's what you get when you sing a country song backwards. You know, you get your dog back, get your cat back, get your first two wives back. I mean, anyway, <laughs> hallelujah. We want to look at this morning some places, and, and we not, may not read the entirety of these passages because they're long. But we want to talk about uh, examples of, of people or groups of people who were in a place of desolation, who were in a place of absolute no way out, and you know, still God made a way out. Amen. And I know that people in our church have been going through things. We've gone through things. The church as a whole has gone through things. But you know what? Those are, those are just things. There's a way out. I said there is a way out. And his name is Jesus, glory to God. Can you say amen? I said can you say amen? You are not hopeless. Hallelujah. The Bible says Abraham who against hope believed in hope that he might, might receive. Lord, I want you to know this. One translation says when he had no reason to have any hope, he still believed, glory to God. Amen. I said amen. amen. When, there was no per when there was nothing there that would give him any reason to believe it was going to get any better, he put his trust in God. Hallelujah. I should have had three runners already. Amen. <clears throat> the Israel, look at it, chapter 14 of the book of Exodus. We know the story, now, and I'm not, I'm not going to um, rehearse the entire movie, The Ten Commandments, before you. You know, what, what they did in three and a half or four hours, the Bible does in three chapters, you know, it's, I'm just teasing. Hallelujah. 
But Exodus chapter 14 is where we're going to kind of jump in there. Now we know that after 400 years of captivity and bondage, that God remembered his covenant. I said God remembered his covenant. Hallelujah. And um, sent them a deliverer. His name was Moses. Moses wasn't the happiest guy in the world. He stuttered. He was a chicken. Yep. Didn't obey God. He was supposed to circumcise his son and didn't. Got in trouble. Angel came, angel came and he had to, his wife had to circumcise him on the spot because he had not done what he was supposed to do. Eat that, 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 that. You don't want to get in trouble doing disobeying God, do you? Hallelujah. And uh, God sends Moses to deliver the children of Israel. And every time that he, he goes to see Pharaoh and says, you know, let my people go. Bible, the Bible says God hardened his heart. But I was reading a commentary recently, uh, studying along this lines, And it says something really interesting. It said the same sun that melts ice dry, makes clay dry. It is the material under the sun that determines what happens to it. And so under the light of God's glory and God's demands, Pharaoh's heart was like clay. It hardened. Hello? To the, to the pliable and the, and the repentant and the humble, it, 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 they're melted in the presence of God. Amen? So and although it says that you know, he hardened his heart, he would harden his heart, it was simply the material he was working with, an unrepentant, atheistic, who, actually, he, he, he was a narcissist because he believed he was a God himself. In the presence of God's glory and God's light, it just hardened his heart more and more. Okay? So just don't think, you know, something, well, it's unjust for God to harden his heart. Think about it now. He was just the material he was, he was shining his light on. Okay? And that material hardened. That's why you can preach a sermon in certain, certain times, and you may have somebody sitting in one seat that's getting blessed, their socks blessed off, and the next person's getting ticked off. One person is getting revelation and getting faith and getting answers from heaven, and the other person is calling you a, 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 all kinds of names. Why? The material you're working with. That's why, that, that's why the Bible says for us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he'll lift us up. We've got to keep our material right. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so anyway, all the plagues coming, and, and each of the plagues dealt with, in, in, in some way or another, the gods or the deities of, of Egypt. And you know, they worship, you know, different things. They worship the water. They, you know, they had goddesses and a god and a goddess of the, of the Nile when that was turned to blood. You know, they had, you know, they had different gods. Uh, when the cattle were all stricken, they had gods of the, they, they represented the cattle. So everything, God kept coming to Egypt and saying, your God's no match for me. Hallelujah. Now, of the plagues, three of them, the Egyptian uh, magicians were able to imitate or, 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 or something along that line. But the rest of them, they couldn't. By the time the boils showed up, they couldn't do anything. Yeah. They wouldn't even come into, come into Pharaoh's presence because they were covered with boils. Mm. And finally, Pharaoh lets them go, you know, and then all the Egyptians give them everything. Get out of our country. Give them the money. Give them the gold. Give them the dresses. Give them, get out of here. Okay? Well, they go out, they go out. Get out there just a little ways, and Pharaoh can say, hey, nah, I, ain't gonna have, I changed my mind. <clears throat> no more brick makers. Nobody to trample the, the mud and the straw into bricks so we can build our, our God, our, our, our great um, buildings and, and to honor our gods and, the, and our Pharaoh and all those kind of things. So Pharaoh takes off after him. Well, uh, it's kind of funny in the Ten Commandments movie, you know, uh, Pharaoh uh, played by... Yul Brenner, Moses, the name of Moses shall be stricken from every, uh, anyway, go worship your God, Moses, you know, <laughs> hallelujah, he goes, their God's not a good general, he's, he's trapped them against the sea, no, God's a smart general, who's supernatural, he'll show off his power and his glory to demonstrate he is the true and the living God. And so when, the, when Pharaoh's army came against them, they were trapped against the sea. A pillar of fire came down and blocked their path. And then God caused a breeze to blow across the, you know, and, and it didn't happen quite like it did, but it's a really cool scene. I watched it the other night. It's still a cool scene. It's over it's 60 years old almost, and it's got to be one of the most, most uh, phenomenal scenes Hollywood has ever come up with. 
the splitting of the Red Sea. That's just cool. Have, have you ever seen it? Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just awesome. <coughs> so children of Israel, you know, right there in front of that. And the bozo followed them. You got to be stupid. You got to think, if he can split it anytime he wants to, he can close it anytime he wants to. I'd be telling Pharaoh, get yourself another chariot driver, dude. I'm, I'm walking home. Hallelujah. This is where we pick up the story. There, there. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. They were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because thou wert no graze in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? Now, I'm going to tell you what. You can have, listen, we, remember we preached earlier this year, Egypt ain't all that. There are people who are so afraid of living by faith and going into the unknown, they'd rather stay in bondage and captivity because it's known to them. You know, we, we talk about this, and, and, it, and it's, it is not, it's not normal, but there are women who will live with an abusive man who beats her because she's afraid to be alone. That's sick. It's not normal. It really isn't normal. But they're so afraid of living on their own and not having, that they'd rather live under that control and that, that, that evil domination than go out on their own. See, that's what the children of Israel, they were so used to living in captivity, they were kind of like, well, I'd just rather stay in captivity than get out there and walk this thing out by faith. <coughs> so they weren't really full of faith. Amen. And, Mo, and Moses, and so for, it should have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. Watch what you say. And Moses said to the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Hallelujah. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Hallelujah. And then he goes to God, and God says, Why are you crying after me? You know what he says? Amen. Uh, and the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. <laughs> There's the water forward. Amen? Now we're not going to read the rest of this. The rest of this goes down through verse 30. Um, you know, where God split the Red Sea, stood it up, uh, congealed it, froze it. Children of Israel went on dry ground. When the Egyptians decided to do so, God just closed the sea up and drowned them. And then Miriam got to singing. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider are thrown into the sea. Glory. Yeah. They got on the other side, and the Bible, just like the Bible said, they'll never see it no more forever. What happened? Right when there was no way out. How many of you ever been there? How many are there right now? You look at this, there's no way out. There's no way out. There's no way out. <clears throat> In the natural, you can't figure it out. You, there's no way out. You can't do nothing to get it fixed. Fear not. Yeah. Stand ye still. See the salvation of your God. Hallelujah. For the Lord, he is Lord. Glory to God. Amen. Come on now. And God said, God, he is God. Glory to God. And he already knew you were where you were going to be between the Pharaoh's army and the Red Sea. He knew you were going to show up there. And he says, go forward. What do you mean? Don't go back. Don't go back to what you came out of. See, he didn't say, he, he could have said, you know, go back. Go back to what they, he just delivered them out of. God did not deliver you to bring you out into the wilderness to kill you. God did not bring you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son so he could bring you down the road so he could destroy you, so that he could destroy your dreams, so that he could destroy your hopes, so that he could destroy your future. God did not bring you out. Are you here listening to me? So that you could, you could, you could crumble and, and fall and be, and be a castaway. And, look up, and everybody look and say, ah, see, they trusted God and look what happened to them. They trusted God and everything fell apart. They trusted God and now they're shipwrecked. God did not bring you this far to see you fail. And it may look like you got the Red Sea in one place and Pharaoh's army on the other. But I got news for years, dry ground awaiting you. I said there's dry ground awaiting you that you can walk over, hallelujah, and you can cross over to the other side, praise God, and start singing. 
I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. My debt and my bills are drowned into the sea. Glory to God. My sickness and disease is drowned into the sea. Glory to God. Are you here? God will make a way where there is no way. Let me say this. He's already got the plan to make a way where there is no way. He didn't catch him off guard. The economy we have right now did not catch God off guard. Your gas prices did not catch God off guard. You may not like them, but it didn't catch them off guard. I went by uh, the other day, and one of the, one of the sheets, I don't know if it's a woman in my house, or one of the gas stations that I passed by on the way to church, it's 369. Two months ago, it was 325. Yeah. Uh, Louis saw a thing this morning that electricity prices probably will never come down. Well, you know, how many, how many, I went to buy steaks the other day, went in the grocery store. <coughs> I was, I actually, I was about looking to buy something. I was just going to say, well, we're going to have to cook on the grill. We'll find something to cook on the grill. Went up, thin cut ribeyes, $9.99 a pound. That was the sale price. Normally eleven fifty nine dollars a pound. Like, ah! <laughs> Hello? You know? <coughs> I mean, I remember, you know, six ninety nine a pound was expensive. Yeah. And it won't that long ago. Yeah. You know, $5 a pound increase? And, that's a, and then they got, you know, it's now nine ninety nine dollars a sale price. Yeah. Have you been to your, local, your favorite restaurant lately and got new menus? Everything's gone up. You can do a McDonald's for family five. It's been $35. Then you're not getting the dollar meal. I mean, if you've got, you got, you know, a quarter pounder, you've got chicken strips or something, you can spend $35 at Mickey D's. Why would you want to do that? I don't know. <laughs> cafeteria, I remember we used to take our family and go get cafeteria food. And, you know, and I like, I like K&W. It's good. You know, we'd spend $13, $14 for the whole family. Now, went in the other day, we just kind of weren't paying attention and, and looked down there at the bill. When I got to the table, it was $35. I'm like, at the calf? Are you kidding me? How many, how many has had your income increase equivalent to the price of everything? Now, some of y'all seen Shannon's new car. She bought a she had her job. We didn't buy it for her. We're not buying it for her. He said, if we were buying it for her, she wouldn't be getting it. She went, she's making enough money. She, and she, you know, she's living at home. So she, she decided she wanted a new car. Well, when we got, when, uh, the insurance company calls and said, look, do you want gap insurance? You know, the lo on the loan. They want a gap insurance on the loan. You know? Well, no. How much is $15 a month more? I'm like, well, over the, over the life of the loan, that's a lot of money. Well, that, what, what that is is, you know, when you buy the car, so you drive out, it loses value. And what they say the car is worth, if you were to total it the next week, if, they, if the car is totaled, you, you probably owe more than they're going to give you for it. And so they have insurance called gap insurance. You know? I want to tell you something, folks. Now, now we're, we're actually, we're going to refinance it because we went to our insurance company and said, hey, we, we finance. We didn't know that. Yeah. And we'll give you the gap insurance for free. Give you a lower rate in gap insurance. Like it. Go, go for it. All right? So we're doing that. Hallelujah. Here, here's your gap insurance. Between the cost of living and what you've been making, between what's going on in your life and what you've been making, it's called faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have a God who has a way to make up the difference, glory to God. We have a God who can bring things. I'm telling you right now, Wednesday night a week ago, I was looking at this thing going, we better, I mean, you know, your mind's going crazy because you're thinking, we are two and a half months behind on the lease. He wants to know when we're going to start paying some money. And I'm sitting back, I ain't got none. We're going to take up a special offer this Sunday and see what happens. Hallelujah. He said, okay. And he's a Christian. Our, our lease agent, not the company, but the agent that we deal with. He, he, he's a Christian. He always calls me Pastor Taylor. And, uh, and he, he said he'll be praying for us and believing that we'll have a good offering. I said, yes, sir. Amen. So, so, and, 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 you know, so we took up the first offer on Sunday. And by the way, so in a four-day span, 60% gone. With this crowd. Now, and we're not talking $600, folks. Yeah. Ten times that. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. 
glory to God. I said glory to God. Make you want to shout. Ow! Glory to God. I mean, I almost felt like James Brown. I feel good. Hallelujah. Are you here? Glory to God. Our God is bigger than our circumstance. And where you're in, we, and listen, the apostle, Paul, the apostle Paul one day, he went to the Lord and said, Lord, you know, uh, there was given unto me a messenger of Satan sent to buffet me because of the revelations. And three times I besought the Lord saying, take this thing from me. Let's get a little revelation here. What Paul wanted was never have to deal with it again. See, you won't ever have any trouble. As long as you're in the flesh, you're going to trouble. Paul said he was surrounded by stuff, but not distressed. One place he said, I was knocked down, but not knocked out. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. But finally, Paul went to the Lord and said, three times I besought the Lord that he might remove this from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For when you are weak, then it's my strength. Now, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. It's my strength manifest. Paul said, I'll rejoice. I will rejoice in the weaknesses of my inability to fix stuff. Because when I get there, God shows up. I said, God shows up. Not only does God show up, God shows out. Amen? God can put on a show. I said God can put on a show. No, not, listen, God's not arrogant. And God didn't, God's not, why? Because he's love. We know he's not arrogant and inflated with pride. But he loves to demonstrate to his people that he has the ability, the power, the willingness, and the means to minister life and to do stuff that they can't get done in their own ability, that they can trust him and he'll come through. Amen. So whatever you're facing today, it might be bad. I know, as a matter of fact, I can guarantee I could probably look out of this room and go find some folks and tell you, I know it's bad. But that's okay. Begin to rejoice. You come to your end, rejoice. That's, that's what God was telling Paul. When you get to the end of you, rejoice. Why? Because then I'm showing up. And I will do what you could not do. And I will manifest what you could not manifest. And I'll fix what you could not fix. And I'll bring forth what you could not bring forth. Hallelujah. Because he's God. God's bigger than that situation. God is your gap insurance. Amen? See, God is your gap insurance. Hallelujah. <clears throat> the, the need may be bigger than what you, you know. I mean, let's face it. Stuff's happening. All around us, if you turn on the news, you could get really depressed. How many turned the news on and gotten depressed? Don't tell me that you did. All right. But you can turn it on. You, you, you look at it and go, oh, my God, we got, we got to put up with more of this, and they're doing this. And, and the politics in Washington have become so, I mean, you, you don't think there's anybody, any part of anybody that cares about the people. They're all vying, they're all vying for uh, power and money. That, you know, you get, kind of get fed up with it. We see things happening that, that show us that the t end times are coming. Just saw the other day that one scientist says that it won't, not too far future, everybody will be required to have a microchip. They've already invented them. I mean, just, this, was not, this was not some, you know, Christian saying this. This was mainstream news. They expect everybody to have a microchip. They'll, they'll read and all this kind of stuff. They can track you. Fear not. I said, fear not. Don't be afraid. These things must come to pass. Did you read in the book of Revelation that everybody did not take the mark, would not be able to buy and sell? Hallelujah. That's com it's coming. We know it's coming. We know it's coming, but don't get uptight. Fear not. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Hallelujah. I, he, said, he, he said, in the world you'll have tribulation, but you know, don't worry about that. I've overcome the world. Hallelujah. Woo! Not, not going to. Already has. Yeah. Hallelujah. We're the church, and we're not going out. We're not going out with a whimper. We're going out with a bang. Yes. They won't get all of our bang before we leave. Hallelujah. <laughs> we'll have enough gunpowder to have a big bang. Yes. Amen. 
We're going out in glory. Hallelujah. Jesus is coming back for the church. But we're not going to be defeated in the process. Amen. Amen. Joseph, his brothers took him and sold him into captivity. Because he went and told him his dream. You see, you don't always tell everything God tells you because people get mad. Joseph shared the dream he had of the, of the she's bowing down to him and so forth. And they got mad. First chance they got, they, they took him and sold him and told, went and told daddy's dead. And he went through a bunch of junk. How many have been through a bunch of junk? He could have quit and said, I miss God. I guess, I guess that dream never happened. Those things will never, yeah, it did. I said, yeah, it did. Because over in Genesis chapter uh, 45, they come to him, didn't know. That by the time they seen him years and years later, he had become second in command to Egypt. Only Pharaoh had a higher rank than him. He who was sold into captivity became the second like the vice president, actually with more power. Because he'd been, all this stuff, been, he'd been put in charge of all this stuff. And his brothers come to him. And when he, you know, they had bowed down to him. And all the things he had seen in the dream. But he says, don't, 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 be, don't be upset. Don't be sad. I was sent to preserve our lineage. And you may be going through some tough places. But don't quit. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Amen. Matter of fact, go get all your towels and throw them away. <coughs> Spiritually speaking of white towels, you throw into the ring. Do not throw your towels away that you need baths with. We do want you to take a bath. Please. Especially now that it's getting summertime, you'll be working in the yard and stuff. Hallelujah. Amen. Here we have Joseph taken from his estate and his place wronged he got put you know he, he went and, and, and got uh, ended up in prison and while he was in prison uh you know he began to tell people's dreams and stuff like that actually he got in prison because um see he got in Potiphar's house and while he was in Potiphar's house Potiphar ha had, a, had a hoe for a wife yes I don't know what did you call her she's chasing down trying to trying to seduce him while her husband's outside that's a hoe now, now, country folks call them skanks. All right? So a skanky hoe. All right. You know, she's trying to seduce the, the servant in the house while her husband's outside. What would y'all call that? What? So what's that, Deneen? Skanking a hoe. All right, Deneen, Deneen agrees with me. Get that camera on Deneen so we can get... <laughs> Hallelujah. He runs out of the house. She's ripping his clothes off. He's running outside. Yeah. She's coming on to him strong. Now, I, I remember Jesse Duplantis. Yeah, she was. Jesse Duplantis was in an airport somewhere one time. And this woman came up to him and started hitting up on him, trying to basically say he wanted to know where he was staying. She was ready, willing to go wherever he was going, you know. You know? And uh, he picked up his phone and died 1-800-CHUCK-THAT-HO. No, I'm sorry. You can't watch my DM movies and preach, all right? <laughs> I'm just teasing. Now, right there in the middle of the airport, uh, he grabbed her hand and started screaming, Jezebel, Jezebel, hold on to Jezebel. He didn't have any problem getting rid of her then. She's trying to seduce him right there, you know? And so Joseph, Joseph got, and Potiphar comes in, and his wife says, you know, she ripped her clothes. And he tried to rape me, basically, I'm just, you know? Yeah. And so... He gets mad. He doesn't even think twice that he might have, you know, har harlot here. Throws him in prison. Forgets about him. He gets prison, starts telling people dreams and reading dreams. And then they have, you know, uh, have dreams. And they, they, you know, there's going to be this, this stuff and they can't figure out what it is. So they start asking about it. And finally the, the, the chef goes, hey, hey, when I was in prison, there's a guy down there. And he told me, he read my dream and told me this. They call him up. He tells all the stuff. And next thing you know, he comes out of prison. And he's put in charge of the whole Save the Food program. I mean, he goes from prison, forgotten, overshadowed, treated wrong. I mean, you know, everything in the world could go wrong for him. Next, and one day he is in prison. Next day he's in charge of the Save the Food program. And ends up getting the king's chariot. They all had to bow down to him throughout the whole land. So he can be bad today. He'll be riding the king's chariot tomorrow. Are you here? 
it don't take long for God to do things. And you start figuring out in your head, thinking, this is going to take months, this is going to take years, this is going to take this. What, God, what you think could take years, God could do like this. You could be $10,000 in debt on one Wednesday and four the next Wednesday. How can God do that? God's God. I said, God's God. And Joseph came out. Samson! We know that Samson was supposed to grow his hair, and again, we get the harlot involved. She seduces him to try to find out what his, you know, where his strength comes from. He, he thinks he's in love. Hello. Oh, I'm in love. I'm all shook up. And all she wants to do is get your hair. She wants to find out where your strength comes from. You know, he's running down there messing with the Philistine woman. He's not supposed to be messing with her. He's supposed to be back with the Jewish women. Yep. But they're not good enough. They're homely, I guess. Because <laughs> they wear the little scars and she's down there all, you know, all whatevered up. Skanked up or something. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I mean, she's, she's just, she's a dude. She's, he said, uh, bind me with this kind of cord and it'll keep me, it'll take my strength. And she says, the Philistines are playing. He hops up and breaks it, you know, does all these different things. And finally she plays the, the big, 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 sad eye, puppy dog look, you know, of, you know, if you really love me, you would tell me. And, and, and the fool fell for it. He said, if you cut my hair. We find what she's like. Instantly got a bunch of stuff and got him drunk and cut his hair and then hollered the Philistines upon thee. And when he rose up, he couldn't do anything. He found it real quick where her loyalties lie, didn't he? Are you here? You gone home? Put out his eyes, put him in prison, put him pulling a, a grist mill around for people to come by and mock. He could hear them, he couldn't see the mocker, he could just hear it. Where he's pushing the stone and doing the work every day, every day, every day. But the one thing the Bible says is, wish not his hair grew. And one day they brought him out for sport at the, at the temple of the games. And he said, Lord, let me just this one time. Let me die with the Philistines. Let me win this, restore it. You know, he basically repented. And in that hour, he killed more Philistines in his death than he did in his whole life. Because his hair grew back out. Repented and God restored him. So what's that mean? You may have shorn your hair by making bad decisions in life. And you may be, you know, the mockery of a bunch of people. But don't be afraid. Because your hair will grow and God will restore. And you can do more in the end of your life than you did in your whole life put together. It's never too late. I said it's never too late. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your latter years can be greater than anything you did in your former years. Amen? If Daniel and the lion, well, I'm with time. Ooh, glory. Daniel and the lion's den. He refused, not to, he, he refused to obey the king's command. Remember that? They, they told, you know, the king made, you know, the, his, his guys who didn't like Daniel went and, 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 and tricked the king into making a decree that no one shall worship any idol or graven or image but his. Daniel hears it, goes straight to his house, opens up his windows toward Jerusalem, and prays. And, of course, they went straight there to see what was going on. Saw what was going on, ran right back to the king. You pass the decree. You pass the edict. Hey, Daniel's over there praying to his God. You've got to do something about that. He didn't want to, but he had to. So they bring him in, throw him in the lion's den. Comes back the next morning. The king couldn't even sleep. The king could not sleep. Runs down there. This is over found over in Daniel chapter 6. And the king rose down there and opens, opens up the thing and says, Daniel, is it well with you? He said, oh, king, live forever. He said, the, the God who I serve sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions. He had the best night's sleep. Yeah, old furry lion hair. He just crawled up in there and just took a nap. Hallelujah. Are you here? That's because they weren't hungry. Oh, really? Read the rest of the story. King got mad through all the people in there who, who, who did all this, and the lions jumped on them, ate them, the family, the kids, everything. They were real hungry. Mm -hmm. The angels shut their mouth. You can read it. That's what it says. Break their bones and ate them. I guess that's not good for tattletales. Anyway, 
It's not, it's not telling, telling to go tell the truth. It's when you are setting people up yeah. and maliciously trying to bring bad upon them. God's on your side. I, I, didn't, read any of these, I didn't read all these passages because we we're, we're, we're kind of late. And I didn't want to get into all of it. 1 John 4, 4 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. There's a greater one living in you this morning. I said the greater one in you this morning. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to wonder, am I by myself? Am I hopeless? Am I helpless? Am I left out? No, the greater one's in you. Amen. You can run with joy. You can stand in your place. And you can begin to rejoice in your infirmities like the Apostle Paul. For when you are weak, then are you strong. Glory to God. When you don't have enough, he makes up the, the, the lack. He meets our need, not according to your paycheck. He meets your need exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or even think. So start thinking big. Stop thinking, not going to make it. Start thinking, my God is greater. Start thinking, my God has enough. Start thinking the way out is through God himself, hallelujah. That I'm not going under, I'm going over. Amen? Amen? I'm not going to fail. I'm going to win. I'm not going to lose sight of Jesus in front of me. I'm going to stay right up on his, on his heels, praise God. I forgot which one of my kids it was, but one of them would always step on your heels. They'd follow so close to you. I, yeah, I was thinking it was Nathan. I didn't want to say that in Jan saying, Shannon goes, it was me. Middle child syndrome. I love to pick on Shannon. Why? You should see the dumbfounded look she gets on her face when I pick on her. Put the camera on it. Let's have it for record. Still on there. It hadn't left. It's still there. Hallelujah. You get so aggravated because he walked right on your heels. You be walking, and he's going to keep up with Daddy. Plant, plant, plant. I'm like, get off my heels. And see, that, that's when he was walking. Before he walked a lot, I used to ride him on my shoulders. He'd take his chin and just grind my head with his chin. <laughs> Will you stop that? <laughs> we need to be following Jesus so close we're just about stepping on the sandals. My, my graduation from Raymond was preached by Oral Roberts. That's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> And he preached tracking with God. And he read the scripture from the Old Testament where it talked about like hind's feet, which is like a deer. And when a deer runs, his front feet hit. And when they pull back, the hind feet come up and hit in the same spot when they're on a full run. And we're to track with God. We're the hind's feet. We're the back feet hitting in the same spot where his feet were. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And when we understand that we, we keep following after God and keep our eye on him and don't look back and don't look to the left and don't look to the right and just keep looking to God, God's going to make a way where there is no way. <clears throat> and we don't have to be worried about failure because the greater one's in us. Resurrection life is in us. It raises us up, praise God. You're not going under. So start talking victory. Start talking life. Start talking success. Talk deliverance. Talk God. For whosoever is born of God, 1 John 5, 4, overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. This morning I want to encourage you that no matter what you face today, not only is there a way out, the way out's already been made. Put your trust and faith in God. Trust him. Believe him. Now, it's not lack of trust to make known. Like, as a church, it's not lack of trust to make known a need. That's not, that's not lack of trust. Throughout the Bible, they did that. God, and then God used people to beat need. Now, it's lack of trust to manipulate them. And if you don't get this week, we won't be here next week. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If somebody tells me they're not going to be here next week, if I don't give this week, I'm probably not going to give this week. 
Because what if not enough, enough people don't give this week? And you're going to be gone next week anyway. May as well be gone this week. And we're going to keep going. I mean, if they came in here and took us and said, let's get out of this building, we'd just go meet in a, a, in a hotel. We'd do something to keep going. We're going to keep going. Amen. If they, if they did that, we just keep going. And it may not be fun. It's no fun to have to haul chairs in and set up cameras and set up tables and all that stuff. But you do what you do. And I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm not planning on that. I'm just saying if they did, we would, we would not quit. No. Dear God, I put up a tent in my backyard. We meet on Sunday mornings. Have a tent meeting. Maybe neighbors might not like it. Glory, they might get all the neighbors saved. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. No, no, I'm not, I'm not trying to plan B and C. I'm just telling you, there's, we're not quitting. We can't quit. <clears throat> we got a call. We got we to fulfill a destiny. Satan may be done everything he did. You know, Paul said, I've been knocked down, but not knocked out. Now, a couple times I feel like I've been knocked down. The tractor trailer drove over me and sat there overnight. But I'm not knocked out. Amen. Have you ever felt like that? You ever felt like, I mean, they just parked it on you. Fully loaded. With 50% overload capacity for that trailer. You know, if they got stopped, they'd be arrested for being on the road. If it doesn't matter. This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. We are victorious through Jesus Christ. We don't quit. We don't throw in the towel. We don't run, we don't run and hide. We keep going forward. And when we get to where there's red seas, God just opens it up and we walk over on dry ground. Amen? I mean, Israel got to the Jordan River so many times. Prophet, every time prophets showed up down there, they had to split it. Finally, I think the Jordan River finally just asked God, which way do you want me to go? Because every time some prophet, could you just stop, could you send the prophets to another river? You know? Because they're like, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Bam, they split hither and thither. That means this way and that way. Israel got there, they went over on dry ground. I mean, every time somebody come by, they're going over the, on, over the Jordan on dry ground. Hallelujah. God can split your rivers. God can bring you through the Red Sea. He said, I'll make the crooked path straight. He'll fill in the valleys and hewn down the mountains. It's a highway to heaven. Can you say amen? Put your trust in him. Trust God. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Glory to God. Turn your eyes to Jesus. Get them off of the circumstances of life. Put your trust in the Lord and watch God deliver you and bring you out. Amen. Amen.